is the earliest healthcare diabetes educator course for Africa that usually trains diabetes educators in Africa. She's also a board member of the African Society of Pediatric Endocrinologists and the Pediatric Endocrinology Society of Kenya. And uh, she's very passionate about improving diabetes care and generally um, care of children with uh, endocrine disorders uh, in Kenya and in Africa. And um, she has done, she, she has uh, several, she has done several studies and uh, several publications. Over to you, uh, Dr. Joyce Haribu. Thank you, Dr. Saumu. Thank you for the uh, warm welcome. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for honoring us to join this um, topic. We'll be talking about hypoglycemia. It is one of the topics I feel that once as a healthcare provider, you get comfortable um, talking about uh, hypoglycemia and also how to educate our patients on hypoglycemia, then it gets easier for you to be able to manage diabetes or type 1 diabetes. Um, so welcome to this presentation. Um, just in case, because I do sometimes speak a little bit on the faster side. Um, um, And in case um, you cannot hear me, please do the same. And one of my panelists will let me know um, so that I can speak a little bit louder. Um, so thank you and let us start. Huh? So this is going to be my outline. Um, we'll have an introduction, talk about, about the symptoms that we know, treat. Is very common in our setting. Have a little bit of like some case presentations and then conclude. Eh? So at the very end, I hope that you'll be very comfortable in recognizing hypoglycemia, knowing how to manage it first as a healthcare provider, but also how to teach um, our parents and also children with um, diabetes. either to be hypoglycemic and awareness, and at the very end, be able to actually work up a patient who has hypoglycemia. So let's talk. About, let's start with the introduction. Hypoglycemia is a common occurrence in type 1 diabetes, and unfortunately, it is actually a limiting factor in us achieving optimal care. And if I was to talk out of experience, when a patient actually experiences or a guardian notices a child has a hypoglycemia episode, generally after that, they get so scared about managing diabetes the way you want them with tight control. So this is something that we need to get comfortable with, knowing about how to recognize it and also how to teach our patients how to manage it so that they don't get scared of, um, of uh, managing their type 1 diabetes. But why does it happen? It generally happens because you're actually having a mismatch between two things. The amount of insulin that the child has gotten plus the amount of food that the child has gotten. Either one, you've given too much insulin for the food that they've eaten, or they have eaten too little food for the insulin that is in their system. So generally what is happening here is that the insulin at the very end is more than the starch that is actually in the system. So how do you introduce it or how do you define it? And I want to categorize it into three parts. Eh? Please follow me or just walk with me. We talk about the clinically hypoglycemic alert. This is technically when a child has a blood sugar that is less than 3.9 millimoles per liter that will require treatment. So please treat a child whose blood sugar is less than 3.9. Then there's something called clinically important or a serious hypoglycemia when the blood sugar is less than three millimoles per liter. Now, that requires treatment immediately. And you really don't want a child to actually have a clinically or a serious hypoglycemia more than 1%. And a patient requires help to manage the hypoglycemic episode that they have had. It can actually have either a coma or a convulsion 
or the patient has severe cognitive impairment. So even if the child, and I'm going to stress this, that the blood sugar is less than three, but they have, they're having severe cognitive impairment, we consider that to be severe hypoglycemia. So irrespective of the blood sugar, as long as the patient has a cognitive impairment or requires someone or a third party to help them manage that, the hypoglycemic episode, we will consider that episode as having severe hypoglycemia. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a CGM or have patients who are on a CGM, ideally you'd want a patient consider that is less than 3.9 millimoles per liter. And then if you compare it with anything else in terms of clinically important or a serious hypoglycemia, you want it to be less than 1%. So in total, generally, you want children to have less hypoglycemic episodes as possible. Less, 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 and less. So... Um, however, we do believe that severe hypoglycemia is actually very common in our setting, and we can estimate it to be around 20%. When we think about the morbidity, it's usually transient, and that's what most of our patients or guardians are concerned about. If you actually manage it, and it is just a hypoglycemia, not severe hypoglycemia, where you clinically important hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, it actually lasts for 36 hours, but thereafter actually resolves. So unlike before, we actually thought that the cognitive dysfunction actually stays with the patient. We now know that once you treat and correct the low blood sugar within an hour, the cognitive dysfunction is actually correct. pronounced dead in bed by the time by the coroner only 15 percent are patients who had type 1 diabetes now what was difficult in this series was to know whether did they pass away because of the hypoglycemia or did they pass away because of other conditions but what we do know of the patients brought in this series to the coroner 15 percent of them had type 1 diabetes Call this the fear of hypoglycemia, meaning that they'd rather have their children having high sugar than having low sugar. Now, if you feel that your patient may have this, it is important to test them to understand what the fear is and when they fear of these hypoglycemic episodes. So how to manage hypoglycemia if actually it happens. So moving on, let's talk about modifiable factors that we think can dispose one person to having a hypoglycemic episode. Again, like I talked about, hypoglycemia happens whether one, there's a mismatch between insulin and a consumed food. But let's talk about insulin. Dr. Joyce, your voice is breaking. I think oh. maybe the internet is quite unstable. Can you hear me now? Sorry, let me go back again. Is this better? Yes, we yes, we can hear you. Okay. I've gone to closer to um the computer and hopefully this will actually be better. So let's talk about going back to modifiable factors that predispose someone to hypoglycemia. And like I said, hypoglycemia is because you're having a mismatch between insulin and the foods that is in the system, right? So now, if we think about insulin, what could be making you to have a, too much insulin compared to the food that you've eaten? And I'd like to talk about the first thing which I'm passionate about, which is the lack of diabetes education.
to of action, when does it start working? When does it peak in the system to ensure that they have food that is adequately there? And then when does it get done in the system? Then there's going to be a problem. So in other words, it's so important for a patient to understand the insulin that they are currently on, whether it is a basal or a bolus. And I believe Dr. Legon took us through that. And if we teach them that, that will help them avoid, number one, too little or too late. For example, when you actually have a rapid acting insulin, but the child delays eating their foods for 30 minutes, they will experience a hypoglycemic episode because in rapid acting insulin, the onset of action is in 15 minutes. So for these children, we teach them that when you inject yourself, they need to eat in 15 minutes. And for the guardian, we literally tell them, serve the food before you inject the child. So that way, then they actually match the onset of action for the medicine plus the food intake and avoid hypoglycemia. Second thing is when you give excess insulin, and this is where our nutritionist is going to come and teach us about how to match the food that we're eating to the insulin. Dr. Joyce, yeah, your voice is breaking again. Oh, I think the internet is unstable. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So again, back to insulin, is that through the nutritionist who will take us through to teach the patients and the guardians for this amount of food, this is the amount of insulin that we need to give them. All right. So that's one insulin. The other thing is about consumed food. For some of our patients, when they miss food, that will mean that they have given themselves insulin and therefore they may actually have a problem with that. Or if they eat too little of the food that they were served. Exercise is one of the components that you're going to go through because you're using the starch that they have within the system to provide energy. So if you actually don't need extra food during that time, that will predispose that child from getting hypoglycemia. In the adolescents, and I'm, let me not assume it's only the adolescents who drink alcohol, but any of the children who have type one diabetes, if they ingest alcohol, it actually blocks the breakdown of um, glycogen from the liver and therefore predisposes them to getting hypoglycemia. need to teach them the effects of alcohol in managing their type 1 diabetes. I hope you can still hear me. Hello? Yes, you are clear now. Okay, good. So let's talk about the non-modifiable factors that really, there's not much we can be able to do. If you're younger, you're unable to express yourself and diabetes for a longer period of time, you lose the ability to respond and, and portray the symptoms of hypoglycemia. In people who have impaired awareness of the hypoglycemia, at an even higher risk of developing what we consider to be severe hypoglycemia. But there are also other comorbidities that are very common in our children with type 1 that predict Important to check for celiac disease because in celiac disease these are the children who are unable to absorb rye gluten and barley and therefore not able to absorb starch and that's why despite giving insulin and not able to absorb starch they get hypoglycemia in children who have addison's disease means their cortisol that predisposes them in developing hypoglycemia because they don't have the hormone cortisol that helps in, car in carbohydrate metabolism. The thyroid also is involved in metabolism. And therefore, when you have low thyroid, that also predisposes you to developing hypoglycemia. 
So in our type 1 diabetics, if they have recurrent episodes of low blood Dr. Joyce, we've lost you again. Gosh. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, but it keeps on uh, breaking. And I'm actually next completely now to the, the computer. I'm sorry for that. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. So for those with comorbidities, if for anyone who has recurrent hypoglycemia, we need to confirm that they don't have any celiac disease, Addison's disease, or hypothyroidism. And that our healthcare providers, especially our pediatric endocrinologists, can guide you on how we can be able to assess for that in our children who have type 1 diabetes. So moving on, what are the most common symptoms of hypoglycemia? different and they portray the hypoglycemic symptoms very differently and especially in the young they have a change in behavior you all of a sudden notice that a child is throwing a temper tantrum is irritable they are crying and a lot of our educators will even stop the education session to just check the sugar because that that means there's something wrong with in the very young that if there's any change in behavior they you should be able to check for um, the level of the blood sugar and ensure that the child is not hypoglycemic in the others we can be able to separate them in, or divide them into two with the autonomic and the neuroglycopenic symptoms now the autonomic ones are fast heartbeats sweating, and a dizziness. In the neuroglycopenic uh, ones, these are children who end up having like some cognitive impairment, such as blurry vision, uh, weakness, headache, nervousness. So usually that. Now for many of the children, what presents first is actually the autonomic, the shaking, the palpitations, the fast heart. or headache. Irrespective of what present, it's so important for the child to learn themselves. So in case they ever get a hypoglycemic episode, go back and ask them, what did you feel? And they will tell you, I felt this. And therefore, kind of trigger in their mind that next time you feel this, please check your blood sugar to confirm that you don't have a what. Dr. Joyce, I think we've lost you again. I don't know maybe whether you can use a different. I think the internet is quite unstable or weak. Okay, just give me one minute. Maybe you can change to another source of internet. Um, give me one second, please. That's okay. Terms are usually specific to them. And therefore, if they actually have um, an episode, go back again and ask them what did they feel? Sensitize them that that could be the symptom that they will actually be portraying. And that in case it ever happens again, they should check their blood sugar and confirm if they're having a hypoglycemic episode. So please use the charts that are readily available to educate the child and also let the child identify what they feel when they have the hypoglycemic episode. So how do you treat? And we're going to divide the treatment into three. Um, treating in terms of a conscious child who has a hypoglycemic episode. So the first thing is to check the blood sugar. If the blood sugar is less than 3.9, you want them to eat a fast-acting carbohydrate Wait for 15 minutes, recheck the blood sugar after 15 minutes. And if the blood sugar is still again less than 3.9 millimoles, then they need to actually 
do the blood test, get, take, take another um, fast acting carbohydrate. However, if the blood sugar is above um, 3.9 millimoles per liter, then they should actually take a meal. Or if it's not the meal time, should actually take a snack. And ideally, a snack is a snack, not a meal. So that should be around 15 grams of carbohydrate. So let's give examples of what we consider to be 15 grams of fast acting carbohydrates. It could be a one tablespoon of honey or sugar. It could be one tablespoon of glucose. It can be one tablespoon of, uh, I mean, half a glass of juice that is readily available or regular soda. Or if you have the availability of what we consider to be carbohydrate tablets, then you can actually use that. So any of this, they should always have, actually to me, it is important that whenever they're working, they should always have a fast acting carbohydrate because hypoglycemia doesn't choose when it's going to happen. And therefore they need to be walking around with a fast acting carbohydrate with them. So please look at that and always make sure that the children are always walking around with any one of these that is readily available. What about examples of carbohydrate snacks? Now, remember I said, once you correct the high sugar, you want to follow that up after 15 minutes with a snack. Now the snack should be 15 grams, which technically means it is one slice of bread, a cup of milk, a small banana. But if you don't have the small bananas, you can actually have the large banana and divide it into half. We currently had pixels, so a small orange, but if it is a big orange, cut it into half. A small apple, or a cup of watermelon. Now really try to use things that are readily available in our setting. So look at the examples you have in your setting. What is 15 grams? So that you teach your child and you teach your guardian that after you correct your low blood sugar, what's readily available? Make sure your child always walks around with this snack to ensure that the child does not become hypoglycemic and the blood sugar maintains at a normal range after that. So we have had examples of fast acting sugars, and now we have had examples of snacks or what you call complex snacks of carbohydrates. Let's go to a second scenario. How do we treat a child who is unconscious and unable to swallow? Now this has happened to me a couple of times. I've even been called by parents who have called me and said that the children are unconscious. So, as healthcare providers, start with ABCs, right? Position on the side, maintain the airway patterns. If you are lucky enough and you have glucagon, go ahead and give glucagon. Now, if you're less than 25 kilograms, give the 0.5 milligram. If you're more than 25 kilograms, then give the one milligram. Recheck the blood sugar after 15 minutes. If the blood sugar is still less than 3.9, give another dose of glycogen. Glucagon, not glycogen, so glucagon. If responsive, then what do you do? Follow the conscious pathway. In other words, go back to what we're talking about. If they're conscious and they're able to swallow, then do the fast acting blood sugar if they're still low. And then check after 15 minutes. If the sugar is back to normal, then give a snack after that. So this is when you have what? Glucagon available. Okay, so treatment of an unconscious or a patient who's unable to swallow. But how many of us have glucagon in our setting? I can guarantee you, majority of us do not have. And in fact, majority of our patients do not have glucagon within their setting. And this unconsciousness does not happen within the hospital setting. So what do we do? In terms of treatment of a child who has type 1 diabetes and there's no glucagon available, still ABC. I still go back again and educate them about ABC. Position on the side, maintain the air. Then this is why I like glucose because you can put a few drops of glucose and then put it either sublingual or on the sides of the cheeks and keep rubbing until the child becomes conscious. Why does this actually come? I was involved in the guidelines of development of the hypoglycemic guidelines for ISPAD. And we looked at data and found that in severe malaria, that different people have actually used sublingual glucose and have shown to actually increase um, the blood sugar just by giving that.
So it's not all hope is lost. Just tell them, have glucose, put a few drops to make it a thick paste. Put it under the tongue if they're, unable, they're able to do that. If not, put it under the cheeks and rub it until the child becomes conscious. Once the child is conscious, then now use the conscious pathway in terms of not correcting hypoglycemia. Please do not give anything by mouth to any child who is unconscious. Please. What about in the hospital setting? Because that happens a lot, right? Child is there, they have an hypoglycemic episode and you have a, um, a line. Give a bolus of dextrose 10% at 2 ml per kilogram. Recheck after 15 minutes. If it's still less than 3.9, repeat again and bolus again. If it is more than 3.9, I want to give it in different um, scenarios. Because a lot of our children become hypoglycemic in the middle of treatment of DKA. And this is what I recommend. If the blood um, dextrose concentration can be increased, please do increase it. Increase it from normal saline to dextrose 5% or increase it from dextrose 5% after you correct the blood sugar to dextrose 10%. If you have reached the maximum of 12.5%, then the next thing, best thing, is not to stop the insulin, but to decrease the insulin dose. Because in DKA, if we stop the treatment or the infusion of the insulin, you're not managing the condition. And therefore, in DKA, when children have a hypoglycemic episode, increase the dextrose concentration to the next step, but keep the insulin infusion going. If they're unconscious, continue the dextrose infusion. If they're conscious, but in the hospital, you can still continue on the dextrose infusion. But if they are conscious and not in DKA, you can follow the conscious pathway and allow them to actually eat a complex carbohydrate that is more than 15 grams. Like I give an example, it can be a slice of bread. It can be half a banana, if it's a large banana, or a small orange, or a 200 ml of milk, whatever is readily available. So we've talked about three scenarios. We've talked about the scenarios of a conscious child. We've talked about scenarios of an unconscious child. And we've talked about a scenario of treatment in the hospital setting. So having said that, in order for the conscious child to be able to manage the hypoglycemic episode, it is important for them to be walking around with what we call a hypoglycemia kit. Now, a hypoglycemia con consists of things that we ask them to carry around. It includes the glucometer, the blood glucose strip. It includes fast-acting carbohydrates, like we talked about, which is either sugar, honey, juice. Right? It includes the 15 grams of snacks of carbohydrates and a book to record if possible. This is what I encourage every healthcare provider to do, to please, please, please ensure that they carry a hypoglycemic kit. And in fact, when I learned about this, any time a patient comes to my office and we're talking, I ask them, do you have your hypo kit? Can you show me if you have it? Because sometimes there are still since they're coming to the hospital, they don't need to carry it. The hypo kit needs to be part of the child. It needs to be part of the child wherever they go so they can be able to manage the hypoglycemic episode. So please. So moving on, I'd like to talk about hypoglycemia and awareness. It happens very commonly in our children who actually have hypoglycemia for a long, I mean, who have type 1 diabetes for a long time. So in type 1 diabetes, there's usually a progressive loss of the glucagon response to insulin-induced hypoglycemia. It can happen as early as one year, but majority of the time, the glucagon synthesis in terms of breaking down uh, glucose from the liver usually stops by the child, by the time the child is five years down the line in terms of diagnosis. So that happens irrespective of what we do. However, there's something also known as impaired awareness of hypoglycemia. And this, what this is, is basically the ability to detect when you have a low blood sugar. So sometimes it can either be diminished or it can actually be absent. And by the time it actually shows, a lot of these children usually have severe 
severe hypoglycemia. And generally it's lost. It occurs because the body has a lower threshold for releasing the counter-regulatory hormones that are generated. And therefore, you need to resensitize the body in order for them to recognize the hypoglycemic episodes to avoid this prolonged hypoglycemia or the severe the hypoglycemia that actually happen. So why am I talking about this? It's because you'll hear of children who end up having seizures, but they did not show any sense of hypoglycemia. And sometimes a child will say, I checked my sugar and I found my sugar is two. And it was just an incidental check-in. That should give you or make you think that maybe that child actually has what you call impaired awareness of hypoglycemia and we need to manage that. So that's why I have decided to talk about that topic. Now, how will you be able to tell if a child has what you call impaired awareness of hypoglycemia? There are several questionnaires that can be used to test for that. The CLAC questionnaire has a higher specificity. It is readily available on the, on the website. And if a child scores more than four, that means they have impaired awareness of hypoglycemia and that a certain things need to be adjusted so the body can readjust to recognize hypoglycemic episodes. So that's why. And why do we want to do that? We want to avoid severe hypoglycemia in these children. So how do you approach a child who has hypoglycemia? And I'm um, doing this so that we can teach ourselves, that we can teach our guardians and our children to think about it this way. Number one, they need to identify the hypoglycemic episode. They need to confirm that. It is important, if possible, that the child checks the blood sugar to confirm if they have a hypoglycemic episode. So please, that's there. If it is confirmed that actually the hypoglycemic episode you want them to learn how to treat it. So I use every opportunity to review the management of hypoglycemia, because it is amazing three years after you have been diagnosed, how they forget and they start doing their own things. Then secondly, you want them to learn about what caused it, identify what caused it, so that next time they're able to prevent that from happening in the future. So what is it? Identify, confirm, treat, and prevent. Let's move forward. Let's do a case here. So I have an 11 year old boy. Now this case is 11. He's currently 17 actually. He had type one diabetes for three years. The concern for this boy is actually that he'd been having hypoglycemic episodes pre lunch Mother was very concerned about the boy not gaining weight. However, the boy is performing well in school. Eh? During this consultation, the boy decided that he needed, he was feeling a lot of, he wanted to pee. So he decided that he wanted to go to the bathroom. So I led him to. The boy is on a basal bolus regimen. That means he's using a basal and a bolus. Basal was lantus, bolus was humana. At 0 0.7 units per kilo per day. So that's our case. So what did I ask him for? His blood sugar reading. So this is the target blood sugar, four to seven millimoles per liter. So I'm going to take you a few steps back. First thing when I get my blood sugar readings, because I usually want them to write it down as pre-breakfast, pre-lunch, and pre-dinner, is that now the first things I look for is the low blood sugar, because I want them to understand. So I went, and yes, indeed, he did have low blood sugars. If you check on day two, pre-lunch, his low blood sugar is 3.1. Then again, I checked on day five, Pre-lunch, the low blood sugar was 3.5 again. So you had two times when the sugar was low. But if you look at the sugar reading, honestly, with a target of 4 to 7, it didn't look so bad. But because the boy walked out while he was in the clinic, to go pee, remember that's a sign of hypoglycemia, I decided to check his blood sugar, only to find that his sugar was high. So as we were discussing, remember, we talked about it, if you go back again, to identify this event. So I asked him, could there be anything happening? I wanted to confirm, did he have any symptoms? He said, yes, I was feeling um, weak. I asked him, so how did you manage it? He was very good at telling me he took 15 grams. He took like a whole tablespoon of sugar. He checked after 15 minutes and after that he ate a snack. 
So then I start challenging him. So what do you think we can do to prevent? And there he couldn't have any answer for me. Back again to this. I then had asked them to do a HB1C. Only to find that his HB1C was high. Now, the purpose of this case was to confirm. Because immediately after that, one of the things I do is I confirm that the blood sugar readings that have been documented are the same as the blood sugar readings that are actually in the glucometer. And one thing that I noted in my patient is that the glucometer reading differed from the ones that were actually above. So you would actually be reacting to hypoglycemic episodes and adjusting management on blood sugar readings that are thick. So number one, like we said, let me go back again. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, identify. Number two is to confirm, meaning that did they check the blood sugar, confirm that the blood sugar is what it was, and you as a healthcare provider, you need to confirm that the blood sugar readings that you are actually looking at are real blood sugar readings and not fake blood sugar readings. Okay? So that is the moral of the story for case number one. So let's talk about case number two. MD is a nine-year-old girl. She's on a basal bolus. She's on insulin, lantus. She's doing carb counting. She knows how to correct her sugar when it is high. She even knows what her target is. So if you look at the blood sugar readings, again, they have been done breakfast, lunch, dinner, and also at night time. So what we were looking at is to actually see if there's any hypoglycemic episodes. And what we noticed is that there's always hypoglycemic episodes at night time. Consistently at night time, that showed us is a pattern in when she's actually having low blood sugar. So when we notice that, the next question comes in, what is it that she takes at dinner that makes her blood sugars at night to be at the lower side? Remember when I said hypoglycemia is a mismatch between insulin and food? Are we giving too much insulin for the food that she's taking? So we go back again for this child and ask, what is the carbohydrate ratio for dinner? I may notice that for dinner, she was taking one unit for every 10 grams. So we realized she was taking more insulin at night, and that was what was causing her sugar to be low at bedtime. So what we did for this girl is that we changed her carbohydrate ratio. So she takes less insulin for the food to avoid the mismatch that was happening in this case too. Again, you can see the way I'm really asking them, put your blood sugar readings, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and at night. And then I'm trying to identify, first thing, why is the low blood sugar? And try to see as a detective what could be causing that low blood sugar. Then I go get in there, do what? I get my glucometer, confirm that that low blood sugar is real. Then I ask my patient, did you have any symptoms? I said, yes. Then I try looking for what could be causing, how did you treat it? And they did. And if they're not treating it well, then you teach them again how to treat hypoglycemic episodes. Once you do that, then say, how can you prevent this child from getting the low blood sugar? And the way to do that is to go back again and look, what could be causing it? Aha, for this child, it's because we're giving too much insulin in the evening. So let's decrease the insulin and see how the child is. And then ask them to check your blood, to give you blood sugar reading two weeks later to see if that has made a significant change. So that is case number two. Let's go to case number three. JT is a nine-year-old boy. He's really keen at improving his speech in HB1C. He knows a twice daily injection, but separate NPH and regular. His insulin dosage is 2.8 units per kilo per day. He has a blood sugar, uh, checks the blood sugar before, but because he has just joined school, we want to know how his sugar is going to be. We need to adjust his insulin dosage because now he's in school compared to the way he's home. So we ask him to do what we call a structured blood glucose testing, where we check before a meal, two hours after meal, to know for that content, because he's on twice daily injection, if for that amount of food that he's eating, are we giving him enough insulin? 
So he went ahead because he's very keen at improving his hb one c at checking this blood sugar as often as this. Remember, this is only done for three days and then stopped because this is what guides a healthcare provider in adjusting the insulin um, to the new setting. And this boy, the new setting was a school, a new school. So that we get, we started checking for the low blood sugar. So day three, we notice there's a low blood sugar. Day two, we also notice a low blood sugar. So we asked him exactly what happened in this day. I said, ah, oh, I love playing football. So immediately after class ends, what does he do? He gets out and he goes clean. So I also asked him, do you check your blood sugar before you exercise? I said, no, I'm playing football. How long do you play football for? What do you mean? I'm not in class from 5.30 to 6.30 because he's in a boarding school. He's going back to class at 7. So he uses that opportunity to play the game that he loves. And so what happens? This is what happened. So I asked him the next question. Did you feel anything? And the boy would tell me, no. In fact, the only reason he checked his blood sugar is because of the instructions that we had and that he did not have any hypoglycemic episodes. So what did this teach me? Number one, we identified it. Number two, um, we ensured that we confirmed it in terms of noticing if he did, he had low blood sugar. We checked his glucometer, which was the same as that. I went again, asked him, did you manage it? And he was not managing it well because he actually was going ahead and eating his cool food without correcting the hypoglycemia with the fast acting insulin. And lastly, the question was, how can I prevent it? Then I realized, aha, we have not taught him about how to exercise. And that's the next thing we did. So we used that opportunity to teach him about exercise. Now, JT, who's a nine-year-old, is actually, what, 35 kilos. Now, we're going to go through exercise. Eh? And uh, my colleagues, Monica and Philip, will take us through. They are diabetic educators, will take us through exercise. So if your child is exercising more than 30 minutes, you're going to go play outside. You want to know what the weight is. So my boy was 35 kilos. So my boy ends up in the middle route between 30 and 50. So then you go back again and say, what? What is the sugar before you exercise? My young boy, who is nine years old, blood sugar was always ranging around five. So what was he really meant to be doing? If it is ranging around five on the days he plays football, he's meant to take 20 grams of carbs before he goes and plays to avoid hypoglycemia. But he wasn't doing that. What was he doing? Gets excited after class, goes outside, changes and plays. So the hypoglycemia that he was experiencing was a result of him being active. Now, my goal and our goal as pediatric endocrinologists is to ensure I children live as normal of a life as possible. So then my goal was to teach him to exercise, to play and exercise safely. And this would be a way of teaching him. So what is an example of 20 grams of carbohydrates? And that actually shows you banana, carrots, mango, and all that. And we were taught actually by one of my colleagues of different ways of putting 20 grams of carbs. So he doesn't have to think much. He just says, okay, so this is what I need to eat. And this is what's readily available. He eats that and he goes plays and enjoys a healthy life. So we have gone through three cases. One, teaching you to always confirm those episodes are real. Two, teaching you that after you confirm that you should always go through to understand if they know how to treat their hypoglycemic episodes. Three, to prevent that and identifying the precipitating factor. And once you identify the precipitating factor, readjust the insulin or readjust the food to avoid the hypoglycemic episodes. So at the very end, as I conclude, remember hypoglycemia can happen our role is to help our patients identify them, help them to know how to manage them in the different scenarios, whether conscious or unconscious, but more so help them prevent it so that it doesn't occur again. Thank you. And um, I'm looking forward to any questions. Okay, thank you.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Joyce, for the excellent presentation. I think despite the initial technical hitches, the rest of the presentation has been great. And it, it has been very clear, very simplified. So thank you very much for that. So I think we can go to Q&A. And um, if you have any question, you can still continue typing it on the Q&A uh, section. So uh, the first question is, uh, kindly repeat that point on Addison's disease as a risk factor for hypoglycemia. Okay, so Addison's disease is as a result of it's an autoimmune disease against the adrenal glands. So as a result, you actually have a low cortisol. Now cortisol plays a role in carbohydrate metabolism. And therefore you're not able to break down the carbohydrates leading to the hypoglycemic episodes that happened during that time. Now the reason I say for any child who has unexplained recurrent hypoglycemic episodes and is a type one diabetic, Generally, we like ruling out these comorbidities such as Addison's, such as hypothyroidism, such as celiac disease, because they do happen in our children um, with type 1 diabetes before saying that there's something that's going on. Thank you, uh, Dr. Joyce. Um, the next uh, questions I will um, ask you to. Uh, two next questions. Is there a role of dextrose boluses in acute uh, treatment? And then there is an anonymous attendee who asks, is there any harm in giving 5 ml per kg of 10% dextrose instead of the 2 ml per kg for the severely hypoglycemic unconscious child to align with uh, what is in the Kenyan Guidelines. basic protocol? Yes. Okay. So I'll start off with that one. Is there a role of dextrose boluses in acute treatment? Now, remember, it's, it's either conscious or unconscious in the hospital setting or non-hospital setting. So if you do have a line, you can actually give the dextrose 10% and you can give a 5 ml per kg. That is okay. Because the aim is to treat as fast and usually say you want to take a glucose or you take a dextrose that is actually a Hussein bolt. Aim is to make sure that the body actually has dextrose as fast as possible in the safest way possible. So 5% is okay. At 5 ml package is okay to align with the national guidelines. Thank you. Then um, Oguido makes a comment, good presentation despite some interruption. Only kindly confirm it if the white particle sweets is the same as glucose tablets. So, <laughs> So we, we assume, and I would say we assume that one particle sweet actually is like five grams of a glucose tablet, not confirmed. Um, so you can actually give like three particle sweets um, to give 15 grams of uh, fast acting glucose. Yes. Thank you. Um, there's uh, someone who needs clarification on the dose of glucagon. So, um, Clarify on the so, use of glucagon, 0 0.5 milligram or 1 milligram, is it per body weight? Yes, it is per body weight. If you're less than 25 uh, kilograms, you use a 0 0.5. If you're more than 25 kilograms, you use the 1 milligram. But I, I just need to emphasize that the glucagon has a short half-life and it's quite expensive. And that's why majority of our patients are unable to afford it. However, I pray that one day we'll be able to afford it because it is, I think it is one of the necessary drugs I believe all our um, type 1 diabetics should be having, in addition to making sure they have also a blood glucose strip and insulin. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how do you advise adolescents who are gaining weight after initiation of, uh, of insulin, but they are on a healthy, balanced diet? Um, gaining weight inappropriately. I think it's important for such a, an adolescent to, to follow up with two people. I believe like the pediatric endocrinologist and the nutritionist to understand what this healthy means. Um, because it's also healthy gain weight, especially in a newly diagnosed diabetic. They have been losing weight for a while. 
And so we all see our newly diagnosed diabetics after initiation of insulin gaining weight because then they're able to absorb the sugar that they had been losing um, through the urine. So I think it really needs to look at it holistically. Is this weight gain um, unhealthy? Are they eating what you call a healthy diet and looking at are they gaining weight as up should be? And if they're not, what can be adjusted? Thank you. Uh, the next question is, is there any role of buco 50% dextrose? Nowadays, it's used in nursery no. as a dose of 0.4 mls per kg. Uh, no, we don't use the, the buco 50%. And we don't then, recommend that. Okay, thank you. Then Evans is asking you to explain more about intranasal glucagon. Wow. Um, thank you, Evans. I think that is something I will actually respond to you directly because it's not even readily available in this country. So if you don't mind, just put your email there and I'll be able to talk about that. So that it's something that um, we can benefit for the rest of the um, attendance. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. The The next uh, question is a uh, comment on recurrent hypoglycemic episodes in a toddler without diabetes and not malnutrition. Although I think that one is uh, out of scope okay. of to do. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's actually... That's, that's a... Yeah, totally different topic <laughs> altogether. Okay. Yeah, so anonymous attendee, I think that one uh, will be covered in future CMEs. Uh, mm -hmm. Just keep on checking because it's a whole topic that will take even like one hour, one and a half hours. Mm -hmm. And then um, any, uh, how about parental dextrose administration in unconscious patients compared to sublingual administration? I, I would recommend sublingual administration of, of, gluco, of glucose. It has been shown to work very well in patients who actually have severe malaria, increasing the amount of glucose in the system. So that's what I'd actually um, recommend. And our guidelines, that's what we'll be recommending. And, uh, then, uh, thank you. There's someone asking whether we have the continuous glucose monitoring devices in Kenya. Are they available? They are available, but quite costly, but they are very available for those who can be able to afford them. Yes. So okay. continuous glucose meters are readily available, um, however, very costly. Thank you. The other question, we have two more questions. Um, Doc, please comment about the boy number three, case number three in boarding school who played footy boy he had two episodes of hypoglycemia, but the rest of the random blood sugars were very high. What was done about this? Okay, I think for that, I'll need to go back to that case. If you can be able to just, um, one second. Um, so we can actually see, I think it's because it's also mixed. Um, so we're talking, uh, and this actually takes us to a different topic because energy talks about like adjusting insulin dosages. And so I wanted to really just stick on the hypoglycemic episodes because when we look at how to read blood sugar readings um, or interpret blood sugar readings, the first thing you actually interpret is uh, look for the low blood sugars and address that. And that's why I started off with that. And by looking at that is where we're able to identify that the child had low blood sugars pre-dinner. Now, the next thing you actually look at is actually the fasting blood sugar to see um, how the fasting blood sugar is. And you can be able to see, yes, in this child actually had fasting blood sugars at the, on the higher side. Now, remember, this child was on MPH um, twice daily and also on regular insulin twice daily. So we know that dinner MPH reflects in the morning. So if you're actually having high blood sugars in the morning, you would like to check a 2 blood sugar, which you're actually seeing here, which was high, and then result again with a high blood sugar. So the goal would be to increase the evening blood sugar to be able to manage that the child would wake up with normal blood sugar readings at breakfast. However, these are things that we will talk about more because if this now is talking about adjusting insulin once you have your blood sugar readings. 
um, so that the child can actually have adequate um, management or adequate uh, control of the type 1 diabetes. Again, I think for me, I emphasize teach the child how to check the sugars, put it that way, look for a pattern as you could see, start with the first low sugar, that's our stop. And one of my colleagues is going to come and take us and say, okay, now that you have low sugars and I've been able to manage that, let's see if you have high sugars. And now we'll talk about how do we adjust our insulin to avoid the high sugars. Okay. All right. Any Thank more questions? You. I think, yeah, I think we have the last question. That is a comment mm -hmm. from uh, Elizabeth who says that that's a great presentation. I have had patients who's recorded glucose readings are uh, quite, there's a really mismatch with their readings in the uh, ward or clinics or HbA1c. It's good to know that we need to confirm this with a glucometer memory reading. And um, kindly explain on rebound hypoglycemia in the management of hypoglycemia in non-diabetic okay. patients. In a diabetic or non-diabetic patient? Non-diabetic. <laughs> I think that is outside the scope of this presentation. And again, for her, like for Eric, I'd ask her to put her um, what do you call this? Her email, so that they can be able to discuss that directly with her. Because now we'll be talking about different scenarios that will actually have um, the current hypoglycemia, just like our patient, the past colleague who talked about um, neonatal hypoglycemia, which is usually the causes are quite different. Um, from type 1 diabetes. Thank you. I think we'll have to take two more questions and then maybe we call it a day. Um, um, still, the other one is still on uh, rebound hypoglycemia. They're asking whether after the initial resuscitation, is there a role for maintenance glucose administration, either IV or per oral? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So after the the, the the truth of the matter is what I was trying to emphasize after you do the fast acting um glucose, um it's always important to follow up with um a complex carbohydrate of like fifteen grams if it is not meal time. So always make sure after you correct the hype the hypoglycemia, you make sure that the blood sugar has jumped up from three point nine to I mean from whatever it was whether it was a two to above three point nine. Always follow that with uh, with an oral. Um, in an in a conscious child, I always recommend now move from an IV if you had used to correct with an IV to oral per oral because you need to keep teaching them how to correct the um the hypoglycemia with something oral after that. Thank you. So our last question is: How are adolescents taken care of with the peer? pressure and the influence of the hormones in their body at this stage? Adolescents are an um, interesting population. I think it's all about connection and also understanding what is important to them. For many of them, they're unable to see the future as much as we get concerned about their future, but they're not as concerned. So you need to look at what they are able to um, focus on that is important for them at that particular point. One of the things I have I have seen is that they do not like the feelings they get with the hypoglycemic episodes. So that would actually be like, since you don't like, um, since they don't like the feeling, they don't like the episodes. Um, they don't, some of them don't like even the embarrassment of having severe hypoglycemia in front of their friends. Then now you can work with them to, to manage that, to prevent that. And, and, and usually it is better that the solutions come from them rather than from you, because it's important for them to own the decisions as they move forward. So it is really a trick, and I usually say that you do need a whole team to work together with them, but it's important for you to understand what ticks in them and work with that to improve their management. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thank Joyce. You. Um, I think we do not have any other questions. And uh, thank you so much, thank Dr. You. Joyce, for this excellent presentation. I believe uh, most of us in the counties or uh, across the country have actually come across a child with hypoglycemia, especially diabetic children. And this is such an eye opener. So as we close, maybe Dr. Joyce, you can give your closing remarks. 
Um, first of all, thank you very much. The fact that you actually joined um, the presentation means that you're really interested in improving the care of our children with type 1 diabetes. I want to thank you very much from both of our hearts, especially from PESC. Um, because we really want to improve our care. We want to see our children actually achieve their dreams. As a take home, I just want to say that it's important for us to identify um, a child who has hypoglycemia. Let them identify their symptoms. Let us let them confirm if they can, um, that indeed they actually have a low blood sugar. Please always go through the management with them and eventually always teach them how to think about how to prevent it the next time. And last but not least, Always ask your diabetic, did you come with your hypokit? Show me your hypokit. So that then you know, even as you teach them, they can be able to actually do what you want them to do at every setting because they're walking around with their hypoglycemic kit. Thank you very much for joining us and God bless you. Thank you. I think there being no any other comments or uh, questions, uh, we can Call it a day. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you very much.